A young man was reborn as a noble in a fantasy world with the unique ability of evaluation in a kingdom where the authority of the Summer Fourth Empire was waning giving rise to rebellion. As the nobles grew stronger the governor of Mission had his life taken leading to Mission being divided into two factions, the elder son Quran and the younger Vasmark who proclaimed himself the rightful heir. But Quran was gathering troops to destroy him, and one of his allies would be A.R.S. Levant Lord of a small domain called Lamberg who set off for the War Council. And here we are with the second season of Tensei Kizoku. If you haven't watched the first season yet just click on the card to watch the full season here on the channel. To kick off the second season in the best way make sure to subscribe like and comment so you don't miss out on this fantasy world. But enough talking let's get to the anime. ARS and his group take the carriage bound for the war conference but first they decide to gaze at the ocean as Charlotte had never seen the sea. She ends up tasting the water making Mire laugh and the two begin talking about Mire's men many travels. ARS promises that when the war is over they will explore many places together leaving Charlotte excited. Mire notices ARS's talent for winning people over, but they are forced to flee from a man after Charlotte used an explosion on the sea. With that they arrive at Sempler Castle, where many nobles were gathered. Upon ARS's arrival malicious comments began to circulate about why a lord from a remote domain had been invited to such a conference. Quran finally arrives, and when greeting ARS he is surprised to see Mire generating several remarks as she was the former governor's advisor. Quran recalls the last time he saw her was when she refused his offer as she wanted to leave politics. She responds that she didn't mind trying one last time with the boy who would be a more suitable master than him making Quran laugh. After all she hadn't changed. But one of the nobles warns that she was related to Vasmark's right-hand man and could be a spy which Quran doesn't believe, as she was in Eris's service whom she asked for help because she trusted his abilities. Therefore he wouldn't tolerate any rudeness towards the two, and besides Mire served the last governor brilliantly so they needed her skills to win. And so begins the war council where it is said that Vasmark had a larger infantry, although Quran's troops were more skilled. However Vasmark's commanders were more talented which was attracting neutral nobles to his side. Thus it couldn't be said that they were at an advantage. If they they truly wanted to establish an independent nation defeating Vasmark would be a priority. One of the nobles suggests taking the city of Bertudo one of the three largest along with Sempler and Arcantes and upon conquering it they could win back some nobles to which everyone agrees, except ARS who notices something wrong. He asks for his companion's opinions and Reitz advises Mire to be careful with her words but since everyone's fate depended on this ARS asks her to be direct. Mire questions if they are fools leaving everyone outraged but Quran asks her to continue. Mire responds that in this way they would end up losing. After all it didn't matter if the troops were good or if they had wealth. Without a worthy commander they had no chance. As for Vasmark he was a coward who hid behind the disguise of a perfectionist and wouldn't lift a finger unless he had a 100% chance of victory. In other words it was a coincidence that everyone was still alive and in a war like this Vasmark would win 7 out of 10 times leaving everyone indignant. But she continues saying that to invade Bertudo they would need a ton of troops which would leave Sempler defenseless, and if they took that place Quran would already be defeated as they would have to rush back to Sempler exposing their failure to capture Bertudo which would lead more nobles to join Vasmark's side. Quran responds that they finally got an objective assessment and agreed with everything but still wanted to win the war at any cost. He asks if she has any ideas to which Mire prompts Rosal to share his plan. The nobles question how a child could come up with a decent plan, but Quran wanted to hear him. Rosal began begins by saying that taking Bertudo was a good plan, but there was a chance Sempler could be attacked. For this reason they needed a way to block the enemy making them believe that if they left Arcantes they would be attacked from both sides drawing the province of Paradil into the conflict making them think that Paradil would attack Arcantes. Everyone finds this impossible as Paradil had sworn loyalty to the Imperial family and surely heard about Mission's desire for independence. Thus they would never help. For this reason Rosal wanted to request an intermediary between them which would would be the Emperor of Summerforth surprising everyone. He continues saying they should bribe the Emperor, but the nobles doubt that money would change anything making Reitz question if they were sure. After all the Emperor was a 17-year-old boy who left power in the hands of servants who were the source of corruption and might be bought. Mire thought it was a good plan, and Quran decides to request Imperial intervention to secure Paradil's cooperation, leaving the execution of the plan to ARS, and preparing the necessary funds surprising the boy. After the meeting Mire celebrates, 
saying they would be far above the other servants if it worked out and ARS was confident in Reitz's negotiation skills. However RITZ replies that he couldn't accompany him as discrimination in the imperial capital was very high. To make matters worse Mireille and Charlotte were terrible at this. So Charlotte suggests asking for help from that other person who was tending the flowers ARS had given her. A few days later Leisha is excited to receive Arisa's visit and Hammond greets them but Leisha interrupts the serious conversation between the two as she had prepared a welcome banquet. Reitz apologizes to Hammond for having to feed him but he replies that Reitz was also a guest. He was concerned that his daughter had brought ARS who seemed to want to discuss something serious. Meanwhile Leisha shows ARS the city view and says she has been spending time with the locals which made her value her domain even more as well as appreciate him increasingly. Her father had told her all the wonderful things ARS had done to which ARS replies that most of it was actually done by his companions. Leisha responds that she admired this about him and begins to move closer to the boy who becomes nervous. But Leisha takes him to the greenhouse where the flowers he had given her were asking what he wanted to talk about. ARS responds that he first needed Hammond's permission which she denies. After all she made her own decisions. That's why they were walking alone without stopping. ARS begins to talk about the plan surprising Leisha that he was giving her such an important task. He says that since it was a negotiation outside their lands, he couldn't guarantee her safety. Leisha accepts without hesitation leaving ARS astonished. She explains that she had resolved to do anything he asked but in return wanted them to marry when the war was over. She had decided this ever since they first met and remembered their first walk through Lamberg as she wanted a front row seat to witness the kind world he would create surprising ARS. He begins to think she was expressing her true feelings as she truly loved him. Besides she had always done so much for him so he decided he would speak properly to her when they met. He wonders what he was doing and apologizes to her for being a useless man who ended up making her say this. Therefore it was his turn to speak. He actually wanted her to marry him right now as he had loved her since the day they met and she had been a great blessing in his life. Despite being able to have a quieter wedding after the war, he didn't know how long it would take or what dangers they would encounter in the meantime. He admits he didn't have much to offer her despite being surrounded by incredible companions, but even in the midst of war he wanted her by his side to protect her. An emotional Leisha accepts the proposal, but she would be the one to protect him so that he could continue to follow the path he had chosen with his wonderful companions. Now as his wife she swears to give her life to see his dreams come true. Her father is caught by surprise by the wedding announcement, but he notices that his daughter who had always been obedient now had a different expression, so he agrees to the marriage beginning a grand celebration banquet that leaves everyone moved. A few days later Pham reveals that the one exercising imperial authority was Minister Shakma, who despite being young was very ambitious and promoted any policy that benefited him. Pham advises ARS to be cautious with this difficult adversary. ARS explains that they would go to the capital where they would ask Shakma to mediate a meeting between them and Paradil with Leisha handling the negotiation. However Mirei was worried since they were children so Leisha arranged for Lumire to accompany them. Having a trusted adult subordinate of Quran by their side would lend seriousness to the cause as negotiations often begin even before reaching the table. Mireille admitted that she understood why the boy chose to marry her leaving Charlotte indignant for not yet recognizing the engagement. But Leisha confesses that sharing a house with her was a dream come true making her feel all giddy leading ARS to decide to take Charlotte as their guardian since as they were traveling by ship he wanted her to see the world. But before continuing be sure to subscribe to help us reach our goal of 2,000 subscribers subscribers, and don't forget to like and comment a lot, so you don't miss the next episodes. Now back to the anime. Charlotte sleeps in the carriage while Pham tells ARS and Leisha that he discovered Vasmark had formed an alliance with the province of Sites. Once he had more information he would speak with them again. ARS realizes that at this rate Quran would be fighting on two fronts and Lamberg would be the first place to be attacked if Sites invaded. But Leisha assures him not to worry since with Paradil on their side they'd be evenly matched because any invasion invasion would result in heavy losses on both sides making it difficult for them to cross the border. Therefore they should ensure the negotiation is a success leaving ARS impressed with how much she had thought this through. Leisha blushes admitting that she had studied a lot feeling happy that he trusted her so much. Charlotte breaks the mood despite them thinking she was asleep. When they arrive in Sempler Quran mentions Vasmark's alliance with Sites, but Leisha reveals they were already aware and that after negotiating with Paradil they should negotiate with Sites to prevent the invasion. Quran admits that ARS had an impressive spy and a very in
intelligent wife complimenting ARS's impeccable judgment and apologizing for burdening him. A boy then asks if AINS was responsible for the negotiation, but Quran clarifies that it was ARS and introduces his son Rang. The boy asks if these children would really be able to negotiate, and Quran responds that even though they were vassals he couldn't be rude. Rang apologizes to ARS who looks at his skills as he walks away, but Quran asks to speak privately with ARS. Meanwhile Rang watches them, and Quran asks if ARS could gauge Rang's abilities, saying he had little discipline as a child. Now at 20 years old Quran wanted to draw out the best in his son but didn't know how. ARS responds that Rang's skills may not amount to much now, but he had impressive potential relieving Quran. And so ARS goes to the port where Charlotte is excited to send gifts to the orphanage children, and ARS notices Leisha looking at a brooch. He decides to buy it, and admits that he felt bad for not giving her a wedding ring, so he hoped she'd accept this for now leaving Leisha in awe of the gift. On the ship they are surprised by Rang who says that since they were children they must have felt insecure with only Lumire as the adult. That's why he decided to accompany them. ARS asks if Quran approved, but Rang replies that he didn't need to he was an adult and made his own decisions, and if he returned with a triumph it would please his father. But as the ship began to sail, everyone felt seasick except Charlotte. They end up saving some men in a small boat, and Lumire says they must have been scared as there were rumors of pirates in the area. When Charlotte approaches them, they capture her demanding that everyone hand over their valuables. But Charlotte irritated that they were ruining her first sea voyage attacks them. With the men captured Rang says they attacked the ship of the next governor of mission, and would remain tied up until they reached the capital. But something bothers ARS who asks what they did for a living. Rang replies that they were surely pirates. ARS notes that their knife looked like a fish cleaning tool, and the men admit they were fishermen working in the capital's port taking imperial loans to buy what they needed to work. But the many financial problems in the capital forced them to borrow money from a merchant, and unable to overcome the interest they had to feed their families even if it meant doing wrong. Rang says nothing justifies their actions, but ARS hands them two stones saying that selling them could get them three gold coins. Rang is indignant, and the man says they didn't need his pity. ARS replies that this wasn't pity or charity, but a loan for them to go back to fishing which they could repay whenever without any interest. Rang asks if he really trusted them, and ARS asks if a lord who didn't trust his people could really expect their trust in return. Even with the risk of betrayal he preferred to trust them because nothing would change unless one side tried. He believed that by trusting the people one day they would trust them back leaving Rang admitting that he was a fool and the freed men found him naive. But ARS only hoped they could meet again. Upon arriving in the imperial capital, they noticed that poverty had taken over the place despite the nobles enjoying luxury. ARS wondered if wealth inequality created this kind of divide, and Rang said that Minister Shakma was so blinded by money that he couldn't govern properly. If he was that stupid negotiating would be easier than expected. Leisha asks them to go ahead without her as she had some preparations to make. The next day ARS is curious about why she bought those clothes and jewels. She replies that he would understand later. They then meet Shakma who leaves ARS impressed with his inventiveness diplomacy and ambition. Shakma says that since they have little time they should get straight to the point surely they came for the emperor to mediate negotiations with Paris. Rang introduces himself as the next governor of mission, saying he came to ensure a successful negotiation. Shakma replies that his presence made little difference, as the only thing that mattered was how much they were willing to pay. But let's go back to the previous night when Leisha said the most important thing would be a swift and decisive resolution. They had 2,000 gold coins to offer in negotiations, so if he asked for more they would have to return to Sempler, and the seas of war could turn against them. For a smoother negotiation, they needed to make the other party think they were getting a good deal starting with a very low offer. Now Leisha offers 500 gold coins. Shakma questions whether she forgot a digit and says he wouldn't accept less than 5,000 gold coins. Leisha starts laughing pointing out that 5,000 coins exceeded the empire's current budget so surely he must be joking. Seeing the state of the city it was clear how much they were suffering financially. She then offers 800 coins. Shakma convinced that Sempler could pay more as Leisha Leisha predicted rises to leave, but Leisha in tears pleads for him to wait, and agrees to give 1,000 gold coins saying they couldn't go any higher.
fire. Shakma agrees to help them. ARS recalls Leisha's words that if they made him think he'd squeeze them for everything he would be satisfied with any deal making ARS admit that she was incredible. When ARS asks if he would intervene on their behalf Rang interrupts and orders them to stop this petty talk and pay the man with the 2,000 coins they had brought because they couldn't let him underestimate Sempler's financial capabilities. Shakma questions whether they were trying to deceive him and cancels the negotiation. ARS seeking forgiveness offers the full 2,000 coins. But Shakma responds that Reng had insulted the Prime Minister, and although paying that amount to the Empire along with an adequate apology might suffice he leaves leaving ARS shocked by the failed negotiation. Reng calls him a real fool, saying they'd have to return to Sempler for more money. ARS angry because they had hidden the budget to avoid returning questions why Reng said that. Reng replies that it was ARS's fault for lying had he offered the 2,000 coins up front things would have gone more smoothly. ARS argues that if they had done so Shakma would have asked for even more to take advantage of them. Leisha appearing calm asks them both to settle down as there was nothing they could do about what had happened. Then Leisha runs to the minister apologizing for Reng's rudeness. The minister responds that since they didn't have any more money they would have to return to Sempler. But Leisha says she had something with her beginning to remove her clothes leaving everyone stunned. She says the clothes and jewels were bought from the best seamstress and jeweler in the capital and should be worth a good price. Shakma's attendant estimates them at 500 gold coins and Leisha pleads for his mercy. Shakma impressed by her determination accepts the clothes and the 2,000 coins to mediate with Paradil. But he questions whether Quran was truly loyal to the emperor as he had heard about his desire for independence. Reng responds that the province of Mission sought independence so they had no loyalty to the emperor leaving ARS anxious. But Shakma didn't care and advised them to be cautious in their negotiations with Paradil. That night they celebrated their success despite the small setback, but Leisha revealed that everything had gone exactly as she had planned from the beginning surprising everyone. And that's how we conclude the second episode. Thank you to everyone who stayed until the end and don't forget to help us out with your like subscription and sharing. Thanks and see you next time.